Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning, and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. I'm your moderator, Carl Cassell. Political corruption is defined as the use of powers by government officials or illegitimate, or for illegitimate private gain. An illegal act by an office holder constitutes political corruption only if the act is directly related to their official duties, is done under color of law, or involves trading and influence. As Americans, some feel that we are either experiencing more corruption within ranks of government or the details of government inner workings are more available uh, for our sight. Many of the voting public are becoming uh, either cynical or bitter at the political system and their elected officials because they feel government officials are too far removed from the people they are called to represent. Joining us today, we have three knowledgeable individuals that can offer valuable experience uh, perspective for us this morning. To my immediate left, we have Brian Fagan, attorney at Simmons Perrine Moya Bergman. Good morning. Good morning. In the middle here, we have Bob Rush, attorney for Rush and Nicholson. Good morning. Good morning. And rounding out our panel, we have Stacy Walker, Lynn County Supervisor. Good morning. Good morning. So we'll jump right in. Um, if any of you want to comment on um, is political corruption um, happening more, less, or are we just recognizing it and identifying it because we have the electronic means to, to do so? I'll take a stab at it, Carl. The, I, I don't think it's more, but I think what is particularly troubling to uh, everyone is it's visible. Mm -hmm. We now know uh, how the system is working in part, how it's funded, uh, and a lot of the darkness surrounding money in politics is invisible to us, but the average person who's paying attention to politics knows there's a tremendous amount of money in this system unaccounted for and not visible, but it's there. And, and when you say that from a historical perspective, why not more? Uh, well, uh, it, democracy has been marked from the very beginning of the king calling the first assembly of merchants together in England uh, <laughs> to pass a tax. The, the local merchants uh, uh, helped out those uh, folks called into the assembly to pass that first tax. Uh, but we've, we've been marked from George Washington's earliest days uh, when he ran for uh, the legislature in, in Virginia, the assembly, uh, he got in trouble himself because he was trying to uh, encourage uh, support from voters by offering them uh, hard cider and some other refreshments. But of course when he did that it was legal and when he was running for the House of Burgesses as you noted in your paper on this he spent hundred and ninety five dollars and then later the legislature uh, banned uh, that kind of political activity, which uh, might be uh, the first time America decided to step up and do something about this. But as we've seen, uh, if, you, if you look at today, I mean, the question of whether or not corruption uh, has increased or decreased, I mean, I don't think any one of us can say definitively, but what we do know is that there has been a, an extraordinary increase in spending uh, on elections. And if we are to be concerned about our freedom of speech in this country, then I think we also have to be concerned about the political information uh, that we are consuming and how it's uh, being brought to us and who's sponsoring this information. And as Bob uh, noted earlier, uh, there has been a significant increase in dark money, and that is money that's unaccounted for. So right now, uh, people can contribute to super PACs and super PACs um, aren't required to disclose where this money is coming from. And what we have seen is that it is now, post Citizens United, it is now a new norm for individuals to contribute uh, up to seven figures to one political organization. And again, that begs the question with 
uh, um, only a small group of people in this country able to contribute uh, at that level, um, who is, uh, what kind of democracy do we really have if we are being inundated, inundated with information coming from just a small group of people? I, I agree with, with both of their observations about where we are with this topic of political corruption. It is uh, of a different character maybe uh, than what we saw historically and what, what Bob touched on. Uh, it's not as if it's the Boss Tweed days of New York in the late 1800s or the Pentagrass machine in Kansas City uh, or even the Daily Machine uh, in the 60s. Uh, what we're dealing with in terms of, of corruption uh, is this idea of large money, large sums of money being involved in influencing uh, candidates influencing camp campaigns and frankly influencing the news and how uh, that is being presented to individuals to consumers of it uh, and how they're making their decisions about who they're going to vote for who they're going to work for uh, who they want to represent them uh, so I think it's it's of a different character now and I think one of the challenges that uh, both Stacy and Bob have touched on is this idea of transparency uh, you know, we're in an age where we should learn immediately who is financing whom uh, and what their interests are. Uh, and we have the technological means to do that, uh, but it's not regulated in that way. Uh, because it's difficult to regulate the money in it because uh, the Supreme Court, as Stacy noted, has equated money with free speech. Uh, but what they can do is, is regulate it in terms of our access to that information, who's giving it, and when. Uh, because oftentimes you don't find out who gave to a particular candidate or a cause until well after the election. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> we've heard super PACs, we've heard dark money, uh, Citizens United. So let's start with uh, uh, the Supreme Court's decision on Citizens United and what that meant for the average American citizen or uh, the large corporation uh, uh, in terms of their impacting any political um, uh, election. Uh, if someone wants to, to start. Well, it was a closely uh, divided Supreme Court that held five to four mm -hmm. that many limits in the law on contributions uh, were unconstitutional. Uh, among those, and a, a follow-up case from the Supreme Court, corporations have been, lo and behold, declared to be people and vested with constitutional rights of uh, similar to each of us as individuals. Say that last piece again. <laughs> corporations have been what? Uh, vested with uh, constitutional rights of speech. Hmm. And I, I think that is the, the big uh, unequalizer, if you will, um, because what happened in the 70s, uh, Congress attempted to regulate uh, campaign spending. They tried to regulate the influence um, of money in politics, uh, and that was uh, that legislation was overturned in Buckley v. Vallejo, I believe, where, it, yes. where they essentially the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, "Speech is money. Money is speech." Mm -hmm and you need a compelling interest and that compelling interest is corruption <laughs> uh, and uh, so they allowed uh, or they struck down the restrictions that Congress had put in place and what you saw in Citizens United is that being further eroded and you see the increase of money I, I mean it's astronomical I think uh, since that 2010 decision about the money that has gone into politics yeah. uh, and it's because it's been as Bob noted Money is speech, and corporations are individuals that have rights. You know, my read on this is, is very similar, but I think we have to now start asking the question, what kind of impacts uh, uh, does this decision and uh, the uh, increase in money in our elections, what kind of impacts does that have on our democracy? Mm -hmm. What kind of impacts does it have on our, our, our civic infrastructure and the kinds of discussions we're able to have if, again, uh, special interest groups and super PACs and a few uh, super wealthy individuals are really able to control um, the information uh, that we're consuming. And it's, uh, it's, it's very, very dangerous uh, in, in my view. Um, one of the things I think we have to do, or one of the things I think we can do, because I think um, 
sort of overturning a Supreme Court decision is very hard to do. Uh, you'd either have to have an amendment to the Constitution or you'd have to have a future Supreme Court uh, sort of uh, decide differently than what this Supreme Court has decided. Um, I think what we, we need are real reformers on the Federal Election Commission. Um, and, I, and I say that because this is the body that's really charged with oversight of our federal elections. And right now, um, what you end up having, since there can be three Democrats and three Republicans, are a lot of deadlock decisions on the cases that matter. Um, so uh, when you have uh, uh, super PACs or other uh, entities in violation of this law coordinating with candidates, um, and, and these cases are brought to the commission, uh, you can't get a real uh, consensus here. And so there's, there's never uh, any real uh, sort of uh, oversight of our elections. And that's a huge problem. And in the rare events that there is consensus, it often happens, I think Brian mentioned this earlier, it happens after the election. Mm -hmm. After the election has been decided, the money has been spent and the influence has been had over the electorate. So we really need reformers on the commission. We need to change, uh, uh, give the uh, commission real teeth to hand down penalties that are meaningful to these super PACs with millions of dollars in the bank. Uh, and we also need um, our citizens to be better educated and uh, to understand how to scrutinize the information they receive and to hold elected officials accountable. So, so super PACs stand for super political action committees. Um, how do they work? How does the money flow? And then how is it dispersed uh, to candidates? Well, let's go back uh, a few decades. PACs were originally viewed as a reform change in the law. Mm -hmm. Political action committees were uh, created by the Congress, mm -hmm. recognized by Congress, to put some visibility on the money itself. Mm -hmm. Before um, the Watergate reforms, uh, corporations were, uh, it was unlawful for a corporation to make a campaign contribution. It was unlawful for unions to make contributions. Mm -hmm. The reforms came along, part of the reform movement was to have political action committees, make them visible, tell people who, who's supporting them, who's contributing to them. Now it's gone way out of control in large part because of the Supreme Court. And I think we saw some data that said out of well over half of the money going into super PACs comes from just 190 families, yes. uh, husband and wife uh, families. And I, I believe PACs, they can give directly to candidates. Super PACs cannot, and they cannot coordinate with campaigns. Uh, they uh, don't have the same level of monetary restrictions mm -hmm. that maybe a PAC would have uh, uh, in what it can spend on a particular candidate. Uh, and they also have the same disclosure requirements where they can uh, report, I believe, uh, semi-annually or quarterly. Uh, so they have the same reporting requirements, but uh, they just can't coordinate with a campaign and can't give directly to uh, the, the candidate. And, and another group that's um, this idea of issue advocacy, I think it's 527 groups that uh, uh, don't have the same restrictions, if you will, that uh, the uh, super PACs do. And you'll see those ads on TV where they're out uh, specifically advocating for a particular issue. Uh, and that's also part of the, the dark money, I think, that we've been talking about. And the, the one irritant of that whole system is a certain form of PAC, the Educational Welfare PAC, mm -hmm. you get a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. You and I are subsidizing those rich people that are putting money into those kind of uh, mm -hmm. PACs. And the caveat is that those organizations um, can't have more than 50% of their operations be political in nature, but uh, again, with um, uh, sort of the inability to uh, effectively regulate these uh, organizations, you're seeing these organizations sort of skirt the rules. And Brian mentioned something a couple times, and that is the uh, inability for super PACs to coordinate with candidates. Mm -hmm. But again, 
the FEC has been unable to regulate that and what you essentially have now are candidates going on TV and giving directions in no uncertain terms to super PACs working on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So they're coordinating in plain sight, but we don't have the federal regulatory body that's able to do anything about it. So how do we stem the flow of money and how it is starting to um, dictate uh, elections uh, uh, in our country, um, kind of, as you mentioned, backed by or directed by specific candidates? I, I think that issue of transparency is, is paramount. I, I think immediate disclosure of any contribution, whether it's a candidate, a super PAC, a 527, uh, or any other type of uh, welfare organization uh, that is organized under the IRS code for political or social or educational purposes. I think that is uh, critical. But the, the greatest antidote is going to be the well-informed citizen uh, that is involved, that is active, that is communicating with their representatives, uh, and that they learn about. It. it takes time. It takes time to learn about these issues. Uh, and that's the challenge, but it's, I think, the, the strongest antidote uh, is that well-informed citizen. I would add to that, uh, elect people like Stacy and Brian to office to bring about some good change in, in these type of rules. That's Iowa, for example, idea. there is no limit on how much you can contribute to a, to a campaign in, under state law. Mm -hmm. You can give millions mm -hmm. to your candidate of choice. Huge hole in the wall. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, along with that, and I agree with everything that's been stated, along okay. with that, I think we um, also need a serious investigation of public financing of elections in this country. Um, there are other advanced uh, countries in the world uh, that publicly finance their elections, um, and there seems to be more of an engagement of the citizens in these elections. Um, the problem is, I'm not sure if um, we'd ever be able to get the Congress uh, to essentially change the election system that, that they use to be successful. Uh, so that is, again, a classical problem of collective action. But I think we need uh, citizens demanding of their elected officials um, to state on the record their position on public financing. But um, I, I, I would have to, to say I'm in full agreement with Mr. Fagan when he talks about the well-informed citizen because if folks would um, exercise uh, the franchise in a way that rewarded um, uh, public officials for taking um, a principled stance on campaign finance reform, then a lot of these issues would correct themselves. But uh, yet and still, um, the information that inundates our elections tends to support candidates uh, that uh, won't take a principled stance on these issues. And, and, and so that would be my response. So if, if, it's being, if the message is being dictated um, and people are being spoon-fed the information, how are they going to be well-informed if the messages don't allow their other than them going and speaking to the candidate themselves, um, but people don't have the time, or as I mentioned uh, uh, in the intro, they're cynical or numb to the process. How do we um, educate uh, the populace um, in that means when we know the messages coming at them are counterintuitive? Well, um, citizen responsibility is, is something that I think we all agree on. Mm -hmm. and citizen responsibility doesn't mean only going to vote every two years. Certainly. It means paying attention, informing yourself, um, challenging elected people to, to make a priority campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we as citizens have a big, uh, big role to play here. I, and I would add to that, uh, your point is well made, uh, and it's a great observation because it is a challenge. Uh, but I also think um, something, an entity that really contributes to this, and it has been resurgent, is good quality objective journalism mm -hmm. the, from the fourth estate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you've seen a resurgence in that, whether it's at a local level, whether it's at a, a state level or a national level. Um, it, it is a, a challenging environment but that's necessary and I think that's where we've seen some of the pushback as well coming from the press to hold public office holders accountable. And, and I might uh, um, 
maybe go a little bit further uh, in Stacy's comments about the public financing, I think there are two other areas where we could see some improvement. It would be focusing on redistricting. Uh, you know, Bob, when Bob was in the legislature, he, um, for what my observation is, uh, was involved in one of the best um, models that a state can have about how a, a state redistricts its political districts. Um, and, and that's a, a great point. I think we could look at that because just as these campaign finance issues are percolating up to the Supreme Court, so are these redistricting cases uh, from gerrymandered districts um, that, that leave candidates on the extreme mm -hmm. and leaving out, not representing uh, where the majority of Americans live their lives. Uh, so there's that, I think, that we could look at as a solution to this or an antidote to it. And the other one would be term limits. I was never a real fan of term limits, uh, but I've come around on that issue of term limits, and I think there's value in that because uh, they spend so much of their time raising money. Yeah. Uh, that's what they do, and instead not focusing on the legislating part. I, uh, I would second that uh, in terms of redistricting reform and term limits. Uh, but let me just say, too, I have been encouraged from seeing uh, students all across this country, particularly high school students, um, uh, sort of finding their civic voice in a time where uh, they are uh, literally uh, fighting for their lives and they're looking for real reforms in uh, the space of gun legislation in this country. What I'm encouraged by is that these up-and-coming generations will quickly become, will soon become, uh, the largest voting bloc um, here in America. And if these individuals uh, choose to get serious about things like campaign finance reform and things like redistricting reform, um, I think we could see some real movement. So, um, as they say, the kids are all right in my book. So what, one final question, I think, um, are we really a democracy? And if not, um, or if we still are, do we run the risk of eventually not being a democracy with the, uh, with the amount of money and 196 couples yeah. controlling things? Well, I'd maybe put a finer point on it and, and say that we're, we're a republic and we yeah, practice true. democracy. We, true we practice indirect democracy. Yeah. Uh, and that has uh, been successful. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its challenges. Uh, and I think that we are and we will continue to confront those challenges. Um, but money is a big challenge in it. Uh, I think there are certainly uh, threats uh, to our democracy, both within the system, within government, and outside of government. Mm -hmm. And it's identifying and making sure that we have the checks and balances in place to deal with them. Our framers built those checks and balances in uh, to deal with that, and we've spent time here talking about the court system as one of them. I'd say the two biggest challenges, out, outside foreign interference in mm -hmm. elections mm -hmm. and money in politics. And I think we've got the will. I think Stacy identified young people. They led civil rights. They led on Vietnam issues, and um, boy, more power to them. Go yeah. straight ahead and bring us uh, to the top of the of the uh, agenda. Campaign finance reform. I'd say uh, the two greatest existential threats to our democracy um, certainly is uh, an unchecked amount of money that's influencing our elections, but also an apathetic populace. And I think um, as we've discussed, those things go hand in hand. I'd say our democracy is resilient, mm -hmm. uh, but if we are not careful, we could be sliding into a very bad place. But again, I am uh, going to bet on this up and coming generation uh, to save us all. <laughs> yeah, I, and I believe uh, uh, it'll happen as well. I think we still have a couple minutes uh, for um, at least one more question. So um, let's, let's talk about uh, um, the next election cycle. You talk about foreign influence and um, you, talk, you talk about the rise of, of young people. Um, are we going to see a shift? Are we going to see um, uh, those issues be combated, or are we going to get much of the same? 
Well, I, traditionally in a in a off presidential year, you have a depressed voter turnout, and uh, from what I think we've seen publicly, I don't think that's going to be the case uh, this time. And it may go to that issue of of uh, the next generation becoming involved, uh, whether it's um, gun rights or um, school safety that's at issue uh, or social policy that's at issue. Uh, you've seen people taken to the streets in large numbers, and I think you're going to have an increased uh, percentage voter turnout in an off-year election this year. I'm an optimist. I, I believe uh, good things will happen, good people will get involved, and more people will get involved. I, I, I too, am, in, uh, am an eternal optimist, but I will say this. Uh, the federal government needs to get its act together in terms of uh, protecting the integrity of our elections. I think right now they're mired in what should not be a partisan back and forth. I think uh, it is very clear that foreign um, uh, hostile governments have um, uh, tampered with our elections and we should be uh, spending our time figuring out the extent of that interference and how to prevent it in the future. Thank you. Well, man, we could go on for at least another a uh, couple hours. I certainly enjoyed the depth and the knowledge of, uh, of each one of your perspective. Um, you bring uh, so much to this uh, conversation. I would hope um, as you've challenged uh, our populace, get involved uh, locally, uh, at the county level, statewide, and, and certainly federally. Um, because if not, uh, then we're going to see much of the same. Um, and so, if you can and would, um, take this conversation outside of the studio and encourage uh, individuals to um, care about some of these topics as well. So it is virtually impossible to eliminate the perceived process or appearance of political corruption, but we do feel that unless attention is given to the topic, it will continue to spiral out of control. In order to maintain a fruitful democracy, Equal representation must remain for all as an opportunity regardless of financial means. We want to thank our panelists today for engaging in a very provocative topic. Our suggestions to all of you is simple. Please get involved in the political process and hold your elected officials and those who pursue office to the highest standards. Until next time, thank you and good morning.